Good evening, everyone. This was not part of the show. It was not planned. It's uh, Patricia showing her heart. And uh, we need to thank her because, in fact, the reason why Joanna is here is certainly because of the school, but certainly also because of Patricia. So give her a big round of applause because, in fact, that's the one. <clears throat> She's the one who is... Uh, who was so worried on Monday when she didn't get any email answer that, in fact, you may have disappeared from the face of the earth, that she was trying to wonder what do I need to do. Uh, I'm Philippe Dietz, I'm the head of school. I would like to welcome you to ISTP and welcome you to a, a presentation, a discussion between students and, and, and Joanna. Joanna and the school, we have been uh, connected for a long time, Joanna and I as well. We have known each other for a very long time and, and it's someone that has impressed me and is someone that I'm sure will impress you tonight. But what's important when you're in a school as school administrators is to disappear. Because in the end, the reason why we are here is for the students. And we have two great students who are here today who are going to discuss about uh, Joanna and ask questions and lead the conversation. So as every good teacher, it's time for me to disappear, to wish you a wonderful evening and to let our two students start the show. Good evening, everybody. Um, before we start, I'd like to say how thankful we are to have Ms. Hoffman here tonight with us. Uh, it's a real honor to be able to speak with someone like her. Uh, this is Chloe. Uh, I'm Luke. We will be the moderators tonight. Uh, before we let her speak, we'd like to give you a few words of introduction. Uh, Ms. Hoffman was born in Poland. She came to the US for her studies. Uh, she received a bachelor in science from MIT and pursued a doctorate in archaeology from the University of Chicago. Uh, she was not able to complete it because when she was going on a dig in Iran, in Iran um, before she left, there was U US diplomats were taken hostage and her trip was canceled. Uh, after that, friends from MIT, she took a leave of absence from the University of Chicago and friends from MIT prompted her to come to California where she volunteered at Xerox Park. Uh, there she attended some lectures, and at one of the lectures she asked some interesting questions that um, prompted someone else in the crowd, Jeff Raskin, who was the original leader of the Mac team, to ask her to interview at Apple. Uh, after she got in, she became the fifth person on the Mac team and the 327th member at Apple. Joanna Hoffman was... Joanna Hoffman was hired for the Mackinich team in October 1980. She had no real experience in this field, and in fact, it was her first real job. And, <laughs> and in December that same year, Steve Jobs joined the team, and he became the leader. He changed her job from interface guidelines, research, and testing to marketing, which was something she really had never worked in before, and she had no idea what to do. But <laughs> she learned that she had to write the business plan for the team, and she had to find who the customers would be and how she could make the Mac appeal to them. Um, the team was very small, and everyone on the team was extremely young. They were all around 25, and they didn't have much experience either, but the Mac came out three years later in 1984. Joanna Hoffman had a huge impact on Apple. She was the only and first woman on the Mackinich team, and although she faced so many different obstacles, she never failed to deliver her opinion. I read on numerous sources, and Mrs. Hoffman, you can tell me if this is correct, but she actually won an award several times for standing up to Steve Jobs. <laughs> <laughs> so in 1985, she left Apple to work at different startups, including Next. And in 1995, she retired to spend time with her family and focus on her children's education. Actually, both of her kids went to ISDP. <laughs> and before I let um, Joanna speak, I would like to thank her so, so much for coming to speak at our school today. 
Um, I think that you're a true inspiration to young minds like ours, and I hope to make an impact on our society as big as you did. Wow. I'm really impressed with you guys already. I mean, I don't think I can live up to that uh, introduction. There is no way. Um, uh, you, you did your research. You remember my past better than I do. So <laughs> I said, that's, that's great. So I'm here. I am delighted to be here. It's uh, uh, the alma mater for my children. I've also served on the board here and uh, with uh, wonderful people, Patricia and, and Philippe, and I see uh, many faces that I recognize from the faculty and, uh, um, and the administration, as well as some parents and ex-parents and my board mate and board, <laughs> and board members and chairs and so on. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's wonderful to be here and see how much the school has changed also in the positive direction. It's really remarkable, uh, given that we had near-death experiences quite a few times all together and lived through them. So. So, he, yes, I am uh, here to, to answer any questions you may have. Okay, so how would you explain Apple's success and thus your success? Well, uh, you know, Apple's success is, is, uh, is uh, uh, I think, easier to explain <laughs> than my success. Um, Apple did uh, remarkable things. They brought uh, computing uh, essentially from the domain of, uh, of uh, business and giant uh, computers into um, the realm of the personal, of giving everybody uh, access to having this enormous power in their hands, starting with the Apple II long before I joined. Uh, Apple. So, um, but uh, you know, the, 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 what is interesting, and I think what is probably educational for you is 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 that it is it is important which team you join. You know, it's not just uh, important to be pursuing the things that you're really interested in, but it's also important to join the people that you really admire and. Uh, and I think for me that was the case because I joined a group of people that I uh, really fell in love with when, when I talked to them and they were all very inspirational. And uh, you know, at the time, Apple was not a, was a real upstart. And uh, people who were in academia were looking at personal computers as toys. People who were in business were looking at personal computers as toys. And it was sort of beneath them to even take this company seriously. And uh, for me, it was a departure in my mind from um, that orthodoxy to say, no, I'm going to go with this company and with these people because I really believe in what they're doing and it's what they're doing is really great. So I think uh, that's one of the things you should remember <laughs> is it's important to uh, to be part of a group that you really admire and uh, and uh, um, appreciate. It's better to join a team where everybody's better than you than <laughs> to join a team where where you are. You know, you're you're the big honcho. Um, knowing that all the people on the Mac team were so young, around 25 years old. Did you think that it would have anywhere near the amount of success that it's had? Well, you know, we were pretty cocky. I think, um, I think uh, you know, it's true of uh, young people now, except now it's the 18-year-olds who feel the way we did when we were 25. Um, so I, I think that we were uh, we were pretty convinced that we were going to change the world, you know. And when some of the setbacks came, actually, it was somewhat traumatic because we were so convinced that what we were doing was the right thing. And I, I have to give you a little anecdote because when um, I remember when we were um, we were in our twenties and we had. Um, uh, in building the computer, of course, we, we were relying on some of the, our vendors who were providing the, uh, the chips and the hard drives and, and so on. And uh, one of our vendors was Motorola because we were using their 
their chip as our C CPU. And their people would come to talk to us. We were in our 20s and they were in their 40s and they were doing jobs very similar to ours. And we kept thinking, my goodness, you know, they're already in their 40s. They're just product managers and, you know, they're... What, what was interesting is that we didn't appreciate that you age with your own industry. You know, they were their upstarts when they started at Motorola with their industry and they aged with their industry. And so now when I look at the industry, I feel like I'm one of the um, dinosaurs because everybody is so young because this new industry has its own young generation and it's uh, so... Um, uh, roundabout answer to you that uh, I don't think we questioned it very much. We thought, you know, hey, we know, <laughs> we, we know better than all these people. So, and now when, when, whenever I'm confronted with young people who start their own companies and they um, kind of treat me like I was the dinosaur, I keep thinking, don't you understand? I know stuff that you may not know. But that, it doesn't work that way. You know, they have to go and, and make their own mistakes. Was it hard or different being a woman in this industry? Well, let me just uh, say one thing, that I was not the only woman on the, on the Macintosh team. I was the first first to be hired, uh, but I was by no means the, the only one, and there was a whole group of us, as a matter of fact, the woman who built the, the factory where the Macintosh was produced was a uh, Debbie Coleman, and she was a, um, an English major, by the way, from, uh, as an undergraduate, and uh, uh, then she had gone to business school, and she had never built a factory before, so it was a, it's one thing to be, you know, designing things, it's another thing to actually go and build a factory, so this, is, this, is, this was a pretty big deal, and so, uh, so uh, Debbie built the factory, our controller, who was in charge of all our finances, was uh, Susan Barnes, uh, the artist who, who was responsible for the look of the Macintosh was Susan Kerr, uh, and the list goes on and on. I mean, uh, the product marketing uh, manager was, was Barbara uh, Colkin. So we had a, a, a large number of women uh, on the Macintosh team, and Apple itself actually had had women as part of their uh, founding a group, the women who had started as administrative assistants and ended up being vice presidents of, uh, uh, of marketing and Marcom. So, um, so there were quite a number of women in, in the company and in the team as well. Um, so the atmosphere was very um, familial, more than just collegial, but familial. And so you'd really felt like an extended family. You felt very close to other people. So in a, in a, in a funny way, I, I was very fortunate because I never had to confront the fact that I was a woman in a man's world or anything like that. Not at that point in my career, not in that, in that function. Later on, there were instances where it was more difficult, but not in that, at that time. Uh, what would you give to young kids that want to be that want to pursue their dreams that want to pursue their dreams? What advice would you give them? Um, well, you know, my advice is, is is I think unfortunately a little bit cliche, right? Which would be that try things, <laughs> you know, just just. Try things, see how you like them, and if uh, uh, if you are, uh, it doesn't matter whether it is music or if it's technology or if it's uh, if you're good at it, you're going to find a way to get an enormous amount of satisfaction out of it, and if that's what you love, that's what you do. But you know, one of the things that I think many people in this room will tell you is that life is uh, long these days. You know, we are uh, we have a, um, a pretty good life expectancy, and so um, 
you will probably change what you do several times in your life. And so as a result, I would say if you're, if you're, it's okay to try something, to experiment with it, you may get really good at it, you may succeed, you may not succeed, but then you're gonna go on and do another thing and another thing. You know, and sometimes those things will be, will be a continuum and sometimes those things may be radically different. But I'm sure there are people, there are your parents and other people in this audience who will say that they've done several careers changes in their lifetimes. So <clears throat> it's wonderful to try things. That's one of the great things about this valley in particular, about the uh, America in general, but uh, which is not something that you find in many other places, which is it's okay to try and fail. It, there is no disgrace in doing something and failing. So, you know, you learn in the process. So that's, uh, as a matter of fact, I, I, I consider my career a, a whole series of failures. But, I, you know, I got enormous satisfaction out of it. <laughs> so, um, so that was, the, 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 it's important to know what makes you happy and what gives you a thrill, you know, and so, um, um, I was giving a lecture to a group of um, NCAD, actually, you know, some people who are here from France know it's an international business school in France, and to a, to a group of students. And um, one of the things that I wanted to know is how they define success. And it was all over the board, because one of the first answers I got was something like, and, uh, uh, a $150 million IPO with an exit of, I mean, this person just knew exactly all the numbers. I can't even reproduce it because I didn't know what, it's fully what she was talking about. That was one, at one end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum, there were people who were talking about bringing water to, you know, a, a clean water to, uh, uh, to places in the developing world that didn't have any clean water. So. Uh, everyone dis defines their success in different terms and you have to understand what makes you tick. And generally, uh, when, when you have a, uh, a financial goal in mind, it's much trickier to achieve that if you don't have another passion. Because just for its own sake, that's, that, that isn't really a goal in life. What is a goal in life is to pursue something that you're really good at and you're interested in and and the financial success sometimes comes and sometimes, you know, not necessarily in the, in, in, in the ways that, that you would imagine, but the satisfaction you get out of doing what you really, something that gives you a thrill is, is, is just the best thing you can do. What made you stay on the team after Steve Jobs switched your job to a field you didn't know about and you just didn't have any experience in? Um, I think it was exciting to just try and figure out what that was that would be, what that would entail. You know, it, it's, uh, it was just uh, such a learning experience. But uh, you know, it was just um, I really loved the, the idea that we were doing something leading edge in technology, something that will you know be in people's hands. What it was going to look like exactly, it was it it wasn't clear. It was just completely amorphous at, at that stage. And things started gelling and actually started looking like, oh, we have a starting point. We know that we are going to make it based on this particular technology. And that made it so much more real when he actually started to, to put a direction in place that I thought it would be uh, wonderful to participate in, 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 the, in that process, but also in bringing that to people, which is basically what it turns out marketing is, as I learned. <laughs> but, you know, to get it into the hands of people and to make it so that it is attractive to people. Did you know you wanted to work in technology when you were our age? No, I actually, so don't, I would advise not doing what I did. Here's what, what, what my problem was. My problem was at the age of four, I decided I wanted to be a physicist. And so, um, so at your age, I still wanted to be a physicist. At the age of 18, I still wanted to be a physicist. So I was not open to anything else, right? I mean, nothing else in life seemed like it was worth it. Um, so when I went to college and all of a sudden realized that I was not good enough 
to be the kind of physicist I wanted to be, it was a huge major trauma and a big um, life-changing experience, okay? So it, it needn't have been that traumatic if I had been more open before to various possibilities, right? So to have that single-mindedness from an early age and not being open to things, uh, I think was actually a drawback for me. And so, um, uh, but I always loved science and I always liked technology. So in a roundabout way, when I was back in technology, I kind of felt like, uh, you know, it, 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 for me when I was at, when I'm, um, when I was at MIT, the environment was a scientific engineering environment. So I could fantasize about being an archaeologist, doing art, and doing all kinds of other things. But then when I went into a graduate program where I was actually cut off from technology and, and science, all of a sudden I realized that that's, that is not me. I can't be in that environment. That doesn't feel right to me. So being back in a, uh, at working at a leading edge of technology, not physics, but, <laughs> but at least uh, in technology felt really comfortable for me. And, and uh, um, so I was inclined in that direction. In, in some ways, I think you guys have no choice because you are growing up with technology. And so even if you want to be a musician or if you want to be an artist, you're going to be using technology to do all of that. And so there isn't really, um, things are much more fluid. You don't have the same kind of walls and separations between uh, disciplines. Um, it's becoming a lot more interdisciplinary um, just by, by the way life is evolving, by the way uh, things, uh, technology is being integrated into life. So what would you say is your favorite job, the favorite kind of job that you've done throughout your years of work at Apple, at Next, and other startups? I have to say that my favorite part was, was at the very inception, at the beginning. You know, when you're still defining a product, when you are really, there are so many possibilities, and then you have to really work hard to figure out what to leave out instead of what to bring in, in a sense, right? Um, that is a very hard thing, by the way. When you're working on products, the hardest thing is to do less, not to do more. And so, because, um, you know, given infinite time, you can do the ideal product, but to make trade-offs and to decide what to put in and what not to put in, and, uh, and what it makes for a sufficient product. That's a very interesting process. That's a ex very exciting process. So, at the very beginning of each project, it was very exciting. But then you know what happens is that then you have to do the grunge work. You have to introduce the product. You have to go. Uh, it, it, it is, um, those things require much more discipline as it, it, as it becomes more real. And I'm not a terribly disciplined person, so I, fortunately that was not always my favorite part. But, but yeah. OK, I think that's all the questions we have. Thank you. <laughs> A hand to the uh, to the moderators here. They're great. They're great. Good evening, and thank you very much for your insight. Um, I'm an em engineer myself, mother of two here, and I'm thinking as far thinking about the student population, the highly privileged student population at ISTP. What do you foresee to be their biggest challenge as they're getting into college and the workforce? Um, I think the challenge is going to be college. First, it's going to be college itself because the college is going to be to get redefined. Um, by the time they're, depending how old you, well, for you, I think by the time you get to college, uh, there will be uh, a lot of soul searching in colleges as to what, what constitutes a college and uh, 
what it means to have a liberal education, a four-year education, or maybe not a four-year education. So a lot of things are going to be in flux and being open to various uh, changes, I think, is going to be one of the challenges in trying to figure out exactly how you want to structure your education. I mean, you can essentially learn anything you want to learn for free online, right? I mean, let's, let's face it, it's just, everything is out there, it's completely available. And so, so, so what constitutes a college? Why are you going to college? What, what is it that you want to learn? And, uh, and is it worth it? <laughs> you know, is it worth the four years? Is it worth the expense? I think there will be a lot of these kinds of uh, th uh, questions that are going to, um, um, to be very uh, formative, not just for you, but for the educational industry itself. So the educational industry is going to go through a redefinition and you guys are going to be part of that. And it's going to be a challenge to figure out exactly how to approach that and take advantage of all the choices that you will have. You'll, I think you will have a lot more choices than any generation before you in how you structure your education. And uh, the challenge is going to be to stay flexible and open and to be able to, um, uh, to say, okay, you know, how I, do I adjust my dreams but also my skills to a completely changing world, which is changing very, very rapidly as... Uh, uh, as, as you see that so much of... Compu computers are taking <laughs> over a lot of the tasks that are now performed by people, right? And it happened in manufacturing, it's going to continue happening in manufacturing, but it's going to progress into the other fields as well. And so, um, uh, remaining alert to that and understanding exactly um, the fact that you know what was true yesterday will not be true tomorrow, and and I can't I can't it sounds like platitudes, but I think it's 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 the truth, and I can't even predict which direction things will go in, but remaining open to that and sensitive to that, and not uh, falling into the standard models of what constituted um, a, a an educated person uh, is going to be one of the challenges. Um, I wanted to say that I really like your style. You look very beautiful and sophisticated, and I really like your watch. <laughs> um, and I wanted to ask, have you considered getting the Apple Watch? <laughs> oh, 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 I see. Well, you know, I've been, we've been talking about the Macintosh in the early days, and right there in the audience is Andy Hertzfeld, who was one of my closest uh, uh, associates and uh, uh, the man who was responsible for the original Macintosh, a huge amount of the code that was part of the original Macintosh was done by Andy Hertzfeld right there. So, uh, I follow Andy and you know, Andy got the Apple Watch. <laughs> so I watched Andy using his Apple Watch and I decided it's not yet for me. <laughs> He's at the bleeding edge. I, I, I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> Hi there. Thanks for coming today. Um, there's a few Apple people here, um, as you can imagine. It's Steve's birthday tomorrow. If he was here with us today, what would you talk to him about? the next big thing about the past, please share. Oh, um, well, that's very personal. <laughs> he, he was, uh, he, he, um, I think we all feel the same way. Uh, you know, he was a friend and a colleague, and um, I think I personally, <laughs> in our case, I think we'd be talking about our kids. So, uh, yeah, it's, that's probably, uh, he was very 
proud of his children, and uh, I, you know, we we talked quite a bit about our kids whenever we had a chance to get together. Um, so I don't think, in my case, I, mean, I think it's different for Andy, it's different for other people, but in my case, I think we would be talking about our children. So, Joanna, tell us what your kids are up to. <laughs> That's a plant. That's my friend, Mark. No, no. <laughs> um, well, one of the reasons why I was talking about education is because my older son dropped out of MIT to compete with MIT. So, <laughs> so what, uh, what he decided to do is to start a... Um, a short and concentrated program in computer science. Uh, and I, it's a little glib on my part to say that to compete with MIT, obviously he's not competing with MIT. He's doing something very targeted, which is um, there is an enormous uh, shortage of uh, uh, talent in, uh, uh, in high-tech, and especially in programming. And uh, as the folks from Apple know, they... Uh, it's, it's really hard to find people, good people, and uh, uh, we have an enormous deficit in this valley and across in the, uh, everywhere where you have high technology. And so my son's uh, aim is to, to have a concentrated two-year program for, uh, for kids who can do the program, get out into the working world quickly, and uh, they don't pay until he places them in, in, in a company. So part of the program, it's really a Silicon Valley immersion program. It's, it's really, uh, instead of the Chinese or French immersion, his is Silicon Valley immersion. He gets these kids uh, acquainted with the companies, with, uh, with various projects in the area and so on. And, uh, places them in uh, companies like LinkedIn and uh, Snapchat and, you know, and then uh, he will charge them once they start earning money, uh, a certain percentage. So that's, that's what he's up to. And by the way, the biggest challenge he's facing right now is that he's, this was, he has done um, uh, seminars and one-year program, and this is the first time, first year of his two-year program. And uh, after you know, three or four months, he's finding that he's placing the students into companies, and so he's not, his retention rate is pretty, pretty grim. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, he'll, he'll have to change his business model a little bit, because uh, even after a few months, the, 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 the kids are being hired away. So, and we're talking about 17-year-olds, 18-year-olds, you know, so. And uh, my younger son is pursuing a liberal arts education at Stanford and uh, dabbling in this and that and, and the other. So there is room for many things on the educational spectrum. And actually, he's in France right now. And he's doing his uh, year ab uh, abroad in France and working on projects in, uh, um, in design and in computer uh, science in France, in Paris, in the sixth. <laughs> Not a bad place to be. So, thank you for asking. <laughs> oh, yes. Tell us a funny Steve Jobs story. <laughs> a funny Steve Jobs story. I wasn't expecting that. There were, uh, let me try and think of that. Uh, um, uh, why is nothing coming to mind? I think because I am feeling a bit, uh, a bit uh, sad about his passing because it is his birthday coming up. Somehow funny things are not coming into my head. But I'll think of something before I leave. So you go ahead and I... You mentioned women and uh, you said it wasn't that difficult at the time. Can you elaborate on this and how you feel now? for the women in technology now? 
Well, you know, I was just at a conference and um, uh, on women in, in general, a women's conference, but there were a lot of people discussing the fact that things have gotten actually tougher for women, not easier. And I'm not exactly sure what the reason is, but they have, there are, have a lot of um, studies uh, that are showing that there is a, a, a hidden bias that women and men have against w women in technology. Somehow, men with the same resume as women, if you just change the name on the resume, they are not as well uh, regarded uh, if it's a, female na it's a female name within identical credentials. So there are now a lot of studies being done and trying to understand what is this hidden bias that maybe we can overcome. How it came about, I'm not sure actually, because uh, in the 80s we thought, okay, that was the, 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 you know, the, uh, the era of discrimination is coming to an end and it's only going to get better and better. But these things have, uh, you know, ups and downs and... Um, and so it's, it's not entirely clear to me what has happened, but I hear a lot from uh, women that, uh, uh, that things are not as easy as it used to be. Um, um, but it's also, I think, part of it is that uh, also that, um, you know, just having children and being in, the, in any profession is, um, uh, is, a, is a challenge. Uh, it still is a challenge. Uh, and, you know, it's an interesting thing because it would be interesting to look at, at the statistics in France because there you have very good childcare. So are the statistics better in France in terms of women in, uh, in, uh, in the workforce and in the higher levels of, uh, of management? And I don't know, I haven't done any comparative studies. But I think that may be playing into it as well, because the r rigors of, uh, of startup, especially culture, um, and there are a lot more startups and a lot more people are working for a lot more startups than they used to, um, does make the kinds of requirements where having a family is a little tough. So I think that may be a factor. I'm not exactly sure why that is. but. I have to say that in my own experience, the only, uh, the only time when I experienced uh, problems was when I was working with established companies on the East Coast or in Europe. And I'm not even talking about Japan because that was, uh, that was a different... Uh, it, what was hard to watch there is how they treated their own women. Um, but, uh, and I'm hoping that things have changed over there, but uh, here I had the experience of working with AT&T and I actually had an executive at AT&T call me little girl. Um, you know, he was, uh, uh, my position at my startup was higher than his position at AT&T, in the AT&T infinite hierarchy. And, uh, but he nonetheless called me uh, a little girl in conversation, so. Hmm? <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> uh, not exactly to his face, but it got to him that I had called him a, um, uh, corporate bimbo. <laughs> so he was, uh, um, you know, I, I had characterized him uh, as an executive from Central Casting. You know, he was like, I'm not one, but I play one on TV. He was like the, the perfect look of an executive with silver hair and everything, but, you know, total empty suit. Anyway, so I think that maybe. He had heard that I had said that, but uh, within his hearing, you know. So I, I, I don't know. But at that at that particular moment, I just I was on the phone and I just hung up on him. So. Hi, I have a question. Lovely talk, and I'm really enjoying it. Um, so the 
there are so many startups you mentioned and so many companies being started by younger and younger people, it seems. Uh, my question is, is there any patterns that you see in the leadership of these companies? And is there any hopes or suggestions or questions or things that are kind of almost like missing pieces of the leadership puzzle in the new and coming leadership of the tech industry? Well, you know, I have to tell you that I'm probably not qualified to answer that question because I'm not in, in it, I'm not immersed, immersed in it enough, and, uh, I, and I'm not as familiar with various uh, uh, situations except through hearsay, through friends who are in it or uh, friends of my children who are in it. Um, the only thing I can, I can say is that um, every industry repeats the same mistakes over and over again. Um, and so um, people uh, just tend to be over... Uh, hubris is, you know, one of the uh, enemies of, uh, of running a successful... Um, a, a successful enterprise. It's an interesting thing because you have to have the confidence and kind of the idealism and being able to convince people, but at the same time, you can't have the, the hubris of not listening or um, not uh, being a good human being in the process. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a, uh, and I think it happens in every generation and in many companies. Uh, you know, I used to have a, a, a matrix that I used uh, to uh, uh, evaluate people that I worked with or, and for. I used to call it the talent ha hassle ratio. Um, is if you have a good height talent to hassle ratio, you are more likely to succeed and you are, it's worth working with these people. But if they are much more hassle than they have talent, you know, then... And so in the case of Steve Jobs, since his talent was close to infinite, he could afford to have an enormous hassle uh, <laughs> coefficient there so that, you know, it's a um, um, denominator, not coefficient. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but I have worked with people who, who didn't have that, and I think that's one of the things that happens in, in leadership a lot, is that uh, people overestimate their talent and their knowledge, and, uh, and therefore they think that they uh, have the right to be a hassle. And so, um, so that's what I can say. I can't be more precise than that because, because I'm, I'm just... It's not, I don't feel comfortable evaluating it. Sorry. Hi, um, thank you so much for being here. I was wondering if you could touch on how you felt your archeological background affected your work in marketing and so on and so forth. Okay, <laughs> so, um, um, I have to say that uh, in working in archaeology, I was working in the uh, in um, in an area which in the uh, that's on the edge of Iran, uh, the Soviet at that time Soviet Armenia, currently Armenia and Turkey. These are not places that are very friendly to women, and so it was a very difficult. Uh, it was very difficult to be able to actually make any progress in that field, uh, uh, being a woman. And uh, so in some ways, maybe it gave me some resiliency, you know, to a tough skin. I don't know that what it was, but it was really, uh, I think that part of it uh, was, uh, was um, helpful. Uh, the um, the thing that wasn't helpful and that actually Steve Jobs quickly weaned me from was the fact that I had come from academia and therefore you know 
uh, I was prone to pontificating. And he was not terribly <laughs> impressed by that. So very quickly, he got me to, uh, to drop the bullshit. So, <laughs> um, but I think that uh, that's one of the baggages I brought with me from academia because, you know, uh, often in that, that world, if you have figured out how to phrase it well, it's as well as good as done. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that was not uh, that was not a uh, something that uh, th that he was uh, open to. So, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, so I th I'd, I'd say just that experience probably um, helps me more than uh, than anything specific in archaeology. Um, what advice do you have for the young um, students and also for all of us um, when dealing with people have, that have a high hassle um, <laughs> quotient? Um, what techniques, what did you use to establish such a close relationship with Steve Jobs? Because I know he was a visionary, but he was also a very demanding leader. Um, so do you have any advice on that? Well, um, it depends, you know, I mean, it depends. Uh, each, each case is individual, right? And, but you have to be very careful in, and, and this is an advice I give especially to women uh, and girls, <laughs> uh, but also uh, men as well. And that is, um, and I, I'm guilty of this, that's why I'm, I'm saying it. Uh, again, everything I say is from personal experience, right? It, I can't really generalize to, uh, to other people, but, what I do, what, one thing I have to say is that making the distinction of what is what to take personally and what not to take personally is very important. So one of the experiences that I had myself and I've noticed it in other uh, women especially is when it comes to negotiating, women just take it extremely personally. It's a just an it's a if if somebody is trying to counter what you are saying or what you are proposing, uh, uh, it's, it's not an attack on you. And so uh, understanding what, it is, what is it that you're discussing and what to, to, to say, oh, oh, this is actually a personal attack uh, versus oh, this is just part of doing business. Um, those are, th th that can be sometimes very hard. And so sometimes when a person is very difficult is because they are, have a conviction and you can argue them out of it if they are a reasonable, rational person for the sake of the project or for the betterment of the, uh, of the product that you're working on or, or what have you. But if somebody is completely irrational or is, is going to attack you personally, there is very little you can do except be in an, yeah, hoping that you have an organizational structure that will defend you. Um, but if you have somebody abusive, it's like any other relationship, you know, don't stick around. Um, don't take it and don't stick around. It's a, um, it, it, but don't mistake, you know, somebody making a, a case for, uh, f for the sake of the project as being a personal attack or something that is that you should be internalized as something against you. So that's, it's a tricky line. I mean, I, I'm sure that everybody here who has been uh, in the work environment knows that it's not always easy to make that distinction. So, but it's important to understand, is it against me? Are they really trying to, are they doing it because they don't like me <laughs> or that they, they're trying to hurt me? Or is it, are they doing it because they think it will make the product more successful or the project more uh, robust. Yes, thanks for coming. Uh, my question will be less serious. I wanted to know if you've seen the Steve Jobs movie. It was a good representation of your time and how, do you f how does it feel to have Kate Wislet uh, plays your life? Oh, um, well, uh, I'll start with the last one, which was that, you know, I can't be more flattered than to have Kate Winslet play the role. She's an amazing uh, actor. She's an incredible uh, f force of nature. She's just, this is a, an amazingly driven woman and, a, you know, just 
um, very talented, very capable, an intelligent actor. So I, you know, I, I can I can't possibly uh, be unhappy about that. Uh, she's uh, so she, she she's amazing. All the acting and I think all the actors were were pretty remarkable. Uh, the difficulty in watching the, the, the film for, for me is to be able to take it as a film, as fiction. Uh, and I think for all of us who had lived through those times, it's a little hard to say, well, this is fiction. It has a, the role that, that Kate Winslet played was not me. It was a, uh, a composite of many people and on top of that fictionalized. Um, Steve Jobs was not Steve Jobs in that movie. I mean, he was a very different person from what, uh, in his daily habits, in the way he expressed himself, etc., etc. Andy was not... <laughs> uh, actually, Andy's character was exactly the opposite of what Andy is like, so, as it turns out. I mean, he played... He, he was a great actor and he played it well, but... Andy is the opposite of whining and saying it can't be done. Andy is the kind of person who would always say, oh yeah, of course, I can do it overnight. You know, so it's, uh, it's, that's why it's a little bit tough for us, I think, to be, uh, to say, well, it was well done, but it's, it's, it's fiction, it's not, it's not, uh, uh, it's not real. One thing I have to, to say, I mean, one, one obvious thing was that Steve never, swore and I kept keep telling this to people that the the profanity in the film is has, has nothing to do with with Steve Jobs he may have been mercurial and the main arc of his personality may be may have been well portrayed in the movie but the 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 details the, he would never actually swear like that that wouldn't be him at all he would cut you down very precisely he would not be using uh, vague words like fuck you. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard it before, so. <laughs> so, Joanna, I remember <clears throat> visiting you in Mariani when the Mac was in development. I saw nothing at all. Everything was secret. But I walked in and I met you and I think we went out to dinner. What I remember is walking in this huge empty building and there was a grand piano in the middle of the atrium. You're right. And I was really struck by that. I thought, how cool that it's a Steinway D, full-size grand piano. Bosendorfer. Oh, I'm sorry, it was a Bosendorfer. Uh, it right. was a Bosendorfer that was Jeff's, with the full That was stamp. Jeff's choice of, of piano, right? No, it was Steve's choice of oh, piano. Oh, that's interesting. Because Jeff <laughs> was actually a Steinway guy. Okay. <laughs> but I thought, these people are treating their work as if it's art. That is the difference between the way you guys did the Macintosh, and yes. anybody else I'd ever met before. And I thought that was a very interesting way to approach the way you did design and, and approach life. So. Well, I think that was actually, yes, you, you are, you're, you're very right, in that Jeff Raskin was a very artistic person. He was a musician, um, uh, the, the man who started the, the project. And then Steve thought of himself as an artist, and he was an artist, and he wanted to bring the artist and everybody who worked for him. And so you're right, you're absolutely right. He had, uh, uh, he loved the design of the Bosendorfer. He loved the fact that uh, every detail in that piano was just completely, so perfectly uh, crafted. Um, so, uh, and people played it. People did, used to play it quite a bit. So, um, the, uh, yes, I think you're right. And I think one of the things that um, I should probably mention in, 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 um, in evaluating the film is that that's, I think, what they were trying to portray. They were trying to portray his artistic side, that he was a real artist and he had the, an artist's personality and uh, because they're Hollywood and they think of themselves as artists as well and of course they are they think well we know artists so they portrayed him more in their own image in in the way the artist in Hollywood behaves I don't know Andy you tell me if I'm 
I, I, this is just a conjecture on my part. But I have a feeling that in some ways the personality that came across was more of a... Uh, that is the essence they were trying to capture, is the artist in him. Yeah. So, yes, I think you're right, yeah. I, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because... Um, Joanna, I have a question. Um, my roommate in that, at that same period of time worked for Apple. She worked on the 2E and the Lisa. Oh, yeah. And her boyfriend was product manager. Um, she would come home sometimes and say, well, we're having a reorg. And the next few weeks were, she was nervous and scared. And I just wanted to know from your perspective, why would they reorganize all the time like they did? It seemed like every few months there was a reorg. <laughs> yeah, you're right, there was. <laughs> all uh, the time. <laughs> I'm not sure I know the answer to that because that, those were the two divisions that uh, we... And, and this is actually... This was, this was not a, a good thing, but in, in a weird way we were set up as a skunk works, um, as a project, in, um, in, uh, in opposition to the other divisions. You know, it was like, it, it was not like, we weren't fully integrated into, into the rest of the Apple culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as a result, I don't really understand, uh, I don't really know what went on and why they reorganized as often as they did. But I think part of it uh, was growing pains and trying to understand how products, marketing, and everything fits together. Uh, and it's, I th I'm sure this happens in, in companies now too. It was, it's often the case that people are just trying stuff that they, they just don't know what is the best way to, to structure things, right? When things become more complex, I think they were struggling with trying to figure out, given the new complexity, more products and more uh, bigger sales and so on. What is the best way to structure things? And sometimes, you know, you have to go and say, well, you know, let's look at precedent and see where it really works. But I don't think that's, that was part of the equation. They would just try and, by trial and error, you know, let's try this. What I do remember is that there was one particular um, uh, management meeting we went to, and they had reorganized the company where they actually had a department called markets marketing, sales selling, do you remember this? <laughs> and, and you know, we were all kind of thinking, okay, well, markets marketing, as opposed to product marketing, okay. Sales selling as opposed to, I couldn't quite figure out. And then they announced the, the head of the, of, of, of one of the, the groups, and his name was Carl Carlson. So I was like, <laughs> you couldn't make this stuff up, you know? <laughs> Maybe that was the reason. <laughs> Maybe, was Maybe the he reason. did that. <laughs> but it was, it was um, I remember, you know, being kind of mystified by some of the ways to try and reorganize. It is disruptive, but at the same time, I think they thought that it adds some dynamism in trying to restructure things to be more um, appropriate to the, to the culture. I don't know, really. It is very disruptive, you're right. <laughs> Um, I've only seen part of the Steve Jobs movie. Uh, do you think you could have done a better job than the person who acted as you? <laughs> oh, you mean it? Oh, uh, no, 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 no. You know, it's, uh, it's a profession like any other profession. And just as I couldn't be a really good doctor, I couldn't really be a good actor either. Uh, these guys uh, have it in their bones and they have a lot of experience and especially uh, her she is uh, uh, she's an amazing uh, actress and she's gone, done theater and she's done movies and uh, and so she's incredibly experienced 
Um, so I think no way I could have done it. Uh, no, <laughs> I couldn't do that job. Yes, hi. A um, couple of, uh, three weeks ago, my nine-year-old and I were in Boston and Cambridge for a few days, and uh, we used to play this game a few years ago here. Whenever she sees a Tesla, she'll say Tesla, and for five days we didn't see a single Tesla, and uh, she was very surprised. I'm like, what do you mean they don't have Teslas? So, and it got me thinking, are our kids growing here, are they in a bubble and in a disconnect with the real world? And how do you really feel about that? <laughs> and, and is it different now than maybe 15 years ago when your children maybe were eight and nine year olds? Mm. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's a bubble by boys in a great bubble. <laughs> you know, would you want to be in any other bubble? Everything has its own bubbles. You know, people who are in the, the um, medical world live in their own little world. You know, people uh, in the film live there in their own little world. We are, are, we are setting the trends. You're going to see more of everything here that is uh, at the leading edge than you'll see anywhere else. Um, so that's the, you know, that's the place we've chosen to live in. Our kids are, are going to be surprised when they go other places. Uh, and, uh, but I think, um, you know, it's, it's so exciting and it's so vibrant here um, in so many areas, whether it's biotechnology, whether it's Teslas or self-driving cars and, um, or educational models, ch changes in, you know, it's all happening and brewing here. It's really remarkable. So um, just the intellectual vitality is so amazing. Um, and you're right, you know, in some extent, when they travel elsewhere, it may be a bit disappointing. Um, but, um, but I think it's, it's much better to go from here somewhere else because you see the future and you're going someplace where you can actually uh, foresee what's coming versus being in a place where you come here and you, you get the future shock, you know. So I, I think it's really, they're very fortunate to be in this environment. It's, and I don't think uh, it was that different for, uh, for our kids. As a matter of fact, it was not that different for Steve Jobs because he was here, he was, his neighbors were HP engineers. He, he understood, he was in the thick of the, you know, at the forefront of technology as it was happening here that was not happening anywhere else. And he was able to, to, uh, to take everything that, that excitement, that thrill of, of the new stuff that's, it's been happening in this valley for a long time, starting with probably National Semiconductor even before. So um, I think it was, it's not just our kids' generation, our children's generation now, or, or my kids before, I think it was even my generation that grew up here, had a different perspective on the world and what can be done than, uh, than I did growing up elsewhere. So what seemed natural to Steve Jobs didn't seem natural to anybody else coming from elsewhere. <laughs> when you um, sit down with your sons and if they take your advice, but what advice do you have for them about how to divine, define success in their life with a never changing world? Uh, <laughs> I think it's a, an advice uh, that I just gave uh, at these two lovely people, which is uh, that, you know, just do what, find what thrills you um, and, uh, and, you know, everything else will fall into place. Uh, and you may have to do that several times and, and try and try again, but uh, it's, there is no harm in trying. So uh, I think that that's it. You know, it's... Uh, um, the, uh, m my favorite uh, writer is, uh, is uh, Vladimir Nabokov, and, 
Nabokov used to say about a reading a really good book that how do you define really good art or you know what constitutes a really good book when you're reading it how do you know it's good and it because the little hairs on the back of your neck stand up that's the kind of thrill it gives you um, I would extend that and say, you know, do something that gives you that thrill and makes the hairs on the back of your head stand up. You know, try and find that. So, so in, in the spirit of uh, following your dream, and, you know, that's also a message that Steve uh, was giving when asked, you know, how, right. to, be, how to define success. Um, going back to the decision that you had to make to join Apple, um, you know, you, it seems to be far from your field of study, uh, whether it's physics or anthropology. Um, how quick or how difficult was it to, uh, you know, jump on board and say, yeah, I'm going to go with this uh, technology company? And I have a second question uh, alongside the uh, the theme of uh, competition within the company. Um, in the movie, you keep seeing was you know, coming back and asking for acknowledgement for the Apple II team. And I'm wondering if um, this is something that was actually, may maybe not just that statement, but the, the cohabitation between the two teams there as when the Mac became uh, a big part of the company, uh, how the Apple II team or the, the rest of the company was leaving this. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I think uh, I'll, I'll answer your, your question, the first question first. Uh, it, uh, <clears throat> in some ways, I suppose I was uh, uh, you just as guilty of being cocky as many of my uh, colleagues were in that um, I kind of felt like, of course I can do this. What's, you know, what's there not to know? I can go and learn this. You know, marketing? Now let, let me pick up a textbook and see what is marketing. You know, what, what do you do? And so I, um, so I didn't really, in some ways I didn't even really stop to think that, oh, maybe this is something I can't do. Um, so that, um, and that was silly to some extent, and I have to say, you know, I really did make quite a few mistakes uh, in terms of pursuing my own career. I mean, if I, I wish somebody had told me things that, that I, I didn't know uh, about, um, oh, simple things like, you know, when you create a product, then you create a product line. It's not that... It's not rocket science, but for some reason it, it took us a while to figure that out with the Macintosh and it was, you know, it was uh, quite a tortured decision. So it's not to say that, um, for me personally, I think I assumed that I could do it, and, uh, but I did have a lot, a lot to learn and I think uh, um, many of us were in that, in that uh, situation. We kind of uh, learned it as we went along. Um, on the other hand, the Apple II people, uh, I think, did know quite a bit more than we did in terms of how to market the channel, the various nuances of uh, the trade-offs that you had to make. Uh, uh, so, in, in, a, in a weird way, I think they were looking at us and thinking, you know, <laughs> hey, we can teach you this. but. Unfortunately, the way uh, Steve's mind uh, worked, of all fortunately, I think, for the industry uh, eventually, is that he never rested on his own laurels. I mean, after all, he worked on the Apple II, right? He was the one with the was. They cr did it together. But he moved on. He never looked back. He never rested on his own laurels, and he just didn't... Uh, expect anybody else to do that. So now, okay, so we, that's done. Let's do the next thing. Let's, do, let's create the future. Let's not dwell in the past. And I think it was hard for the rest of the company. It was because they were paying the bills and, uh, and it must have been really frustrating. And I think one of the reasons that the 
uh, the atmosphere changed and, uh, you know, um, Apple went through this turmoil was because there was quite a bit of ill will. But it wasn't, uh, the, the, re the interaction between Steve and Waz is, is, it was not like that at all. That's not the kind of relationship they had. Uh, but if you were to think of it as the Apple II versus the Macintosh, yes, maybe they, they, they probably did feel underappreciated. Wouldn't you say that, Nelly? Right, so, yeah, you heard it, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so uh, I think there was, there, there was quite a bit of uh, antagonism there. Okay, we have time for one more question. Okay. Um, how did Apple get its name? Oh, I, you know, I wasn't there. I, there are so many stories about that. Andy, do you want, do you know, uh, you know, So yeah, he, he worked in an orchard. Did everybody hear that? Steve Jobs had worked in an or apple orchard before, and so that. But this was before my time. I, I joined in 1980. This was, you know, 76. We're talking about 77. Um, so I'd be very interested to hear, since you are um, a parent of two highly high achieving and successful um, alums of ISTP, and many of us here are current parents. Um, we'd love to hear your articulation of um, the value of an ISTP um, education and how that's contributed to the success of your children. Well, I can tell you uh, very concretely. So, um, my, uh, I wouldn't call them a success yet, <laughs> you know, I would just say, yeah, they're, they're okay, <laughs> but I think uh, it's a little premature to make that assessment, but, but I would say that um, they're both extreme, extremely um, open to uh, have a much broader and bigger horizon uh, in terms of the global potential. My um, older son, in starting his, his enterprise, has raised his money in the Far East. And I think part of it was because he felt very comfortable with the cultures of the Far East, the fact that they're really interested in education and so on. It's one of the first things he thought of is that he would go raise money in the Far East because he's doing an educational enterprise. So, and it didn't daunt him at all. He took uh, Chinese as his foreign language uh, in, uh, you know, in middle school, and uh, uh, he, sell, he felt completely comfortable in going to China and Japan and, and so on. So that was uh, uh, no question that because he had that, um, uh, that background, it just didn't stop him at all. Um, my younger son is doing his, his year abroad in France, and so I, I think the fact that uh, you know, his, his French is native, so it's no, uh, he feels incredibly comfortable there. And, uh, but it's not just that, it's, it's, it's not just the language, because of course the language is symptomatic of the fact that you have a cultural affinity, right? That you, you can have a, 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 a broader view of the world. And one of the things I think that your children coming from ISTP are going to face is when they get to high, if it, it, when they get to high school and then to college, they're going to be surprised to see how parochial their classmates are. Because their assumption is that everybody is as well versed and understanding of, you know, uh, uh, cultures as what they were used to here. And, uh, and I think that in that sense, they have an enormous advantage because, um, you know, two weeks in Costa Rica, you know, on a uh, building a dam or whatever is wonderful, but that's what they think is an international experience, right? 
uh, they don't take it, uh, they are classmates, they, they, this is what they, when they think they're open to the world, this is what, what the experience they bring. They don't have the experience of being deeply, profoundly understanding of the culture, the language, the nuances that the kids here uh, are growing up with from such an early age. So, so that's one thing you have to be prepared is that you guys are going to be, have a much broader horizon than many of the kids that you encounter when you go to high school and to college. Thank you, Joanna, so please hmm? join me to... Oh, I'll tell them. I think. <laughs> So Joanne may not know how to move a product in a product line, but she certainly can promote the school. So I'm going to have her back here, because exactly that, uh, exactly what we would have said. Uh, one funny story about Joanna. Uh, when she first applied to ISTP for older son Jeremy, uh, we did not accept him. <laughs> and uh, I, I wonder today, what if we had not? But in fact, I'm glad because I don't have to know that and I don't have to live to that. So, Joanna, thank you for being here. That's a small token of our appreciation.